your screen big. Okay. Right ahead. Welcome everyone to uh, Desar Group's Six Steps to ISO 9001-2015 Transition. My name is Joe Barquette and I'm with the Desar Group. Our presenter today is Karen Rossin, who's the Vice President of the Desar Group. A couple of things about the controls that you have on hopefully the right-hand side of your screen. You can minimize or maximize the control panel anytime with that little arrow, red arrow up top there. You can make the presentation full screen if you're having difficulty reading the size that Karen has already posted up there. You can raise your hand. Right now everyone is muted by default, but we can unmute as needed. So if you have a question during the middle of the pre presentation, you know, you're able to raise your hand and we'll take a look at it. If we have any handouts, they'll show up under the handout section. Right now we don't have any out there. And then as always, we welcome questions and comments anytime. We'll generally answer them at the end of the presentation, but please enter your questions here wherever you have, and if you can, put down a page number for us if it relates to a specific item on a specific page for us. So that's how to use the webinar controls for us. We're going to talk today about a smart transition for the ISO 9001-2015. The DASAR group is a group of folks that uh, help us and help different companies build more effective and efficient business processes. We're not there just to do a training and run and go. We're there to specialize in helping you understand the standard and understand how to implement specifically the 9001-2015 standard amongst other things. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Karen and uh, have Karen start talking about the transition. Karen? Thanks, Joe. Here here I am, my, my smiling picture again. I've, uh, I've been... Um, See, I'll show you a little bit about my background there. You can see I've emphasized telecommunications. And over the last uh, year or so, I've been working with Quest Forum as a Quest Forum fellow and supervisory master trainer in adding on to ISO 9001-2015 to create the TL9000 standard. And I know we have a bunch of telecommunication professionals on the phone. They've got a little bit longer to get the TL9000 standard out. And we've been that's one of the ways that I've developed a lot of familiarity with ISO 9001 is by digging in deep to it to build upon it. Through, o over the years as a consultant, my role has been helping companies implement management systems and improve their processes. And I've, been, uh, I've also served as a, as a technical expert to accreditation bodies as they have gone out and done audits of their certification bodies. So I feel like I've got a pretty good understanding of what's in ISO 9001-2015 and how it applies to organizations. But what we'll share with you today is the way that DeSera works with our clients, and maybe you can take some, maybe you can take some lessons from here as you create your own plan for implementing ISO 9001. Unless you've been living under a rock, you know the standard is out there. They've told you to start using it as soon as possible. You know your certificate is not valid after 2018. You've got to transition sometime over the next three years. Some certification bodies won't even do an audit to the 2008 version after uh, September of next year of, of 2016. You've seen some, some key words, some knowledge about it. No doubt this isn't the only webinar you've been to so far. You've heard terms like this thrown around. And you may wonder, how are all these things going to apply to you? probably even heard it's better, it's worse, and it's not so different. Well, about today, this webinar is not about what's inside of ISO 9001, though we will touch on a few of those key concepts. Actually, uh, DeSera is going to be presenting a whole series of webinars covering the key concepts, and Joe Barquette, who introduced me this morning, is going to be leading a number of those webinars. So we hope you'll join us for those as well as sign up for some of our in-depth training and implementation workshops. And we'll highlight those at the end of the session. But today, it's not about studying the standard. It's about saying, what do you really have to do to create a plan to transition your organization to ISO 9001-2015? Well, this is the plan that we're taking our clients through. It's a pretty much a six-step process. And these, these steps are not discrete. I even show them as sort of overlapping each other because where it says the content, you know, understanding the content, your understanding of the content of ISO 9001 is going to get deeper and deeper and deeper the longer you live with it. 
And in fact, you'll probably be living with it for about 15 years. If it's, uh, it'll be starting high school before they create another ISO 9001 version. So start digging in deeply now, but you'll learn more and more as you go. So I hope you'll be able to refer to this model as you prepare your own transition project. And I hope some of you find ideas in here that you haven't already considered about how to lead your organization to get the most benefits out of, out of your efforts. Because that's always our goal when we're working with our clients. Now let's start with uh, step one, the content. Step one is about really understanding what's in ISO 9001-2015. If you're on this call, there's a good chance you're a management representative. Uh, you, you may be a consultant. I know we have several of those on the call. You may be key team members, quality professionals who support other teams in implementing uh, the requirements of ISO 9001. So as you've been reading the standard, as you've been attending webinars and so forth, these are the kinds of questions you've probably already been asking yourself. What do we really want to change? Where are we strong or weak? How does this apply to us? How do we get what we want? What's going to be the most difficult? What we're aiming for is in this box here. Do a concentrated analysis of the meaning and impact of both. I, everybody's talking ISO 9001. There's a lot of meat in ISO 9000 itself. Do a concentrated analysis of how that fits to the context of your organization. And it's not enough just for you, the quality geeks, because that's probably who's in a who's in a conference, who, who's in a webinar at this point, the people who really care about it. It's not enough just for us to talk about it among ourselves. In step one, when you're talking about the content of ISO 9001, this is where you begin to socialize the changes. You get the broader group talking. You talk about what it means to the business, and you really listen at this phase of understanding the content, because people tell you. If you don't act like it's a sacred cow, what's wrong with ISO? And if you really understand it, you'll be able to say, well, you know what? Now we've got some weapons to deal with it. We can talk about how it fits in the context of our organization and how we fit in the broader corporate context and how we fit with our, how we fit with our customers, with our corner of the marketplace. What you begin doing is championing the needs of the business and help the business see that this is about the business. It's not about the certificate. We've always tried to say that. Now's a chance to reinforce it with folks. In each of these steps, I'm going to present a uh, three-level model that shows different ways that companies may approach ISO 9001 implementation. Level one is the let's get this done, just give me the basics approach. Okay, this is, this is where it says, I want to learn about understanding the content through reading LinkedIn groups, through going to go to webinars like today. I'm capable of reading the standard. I've been to a few webinars. I can even look up webinars on YouTube and study those things. So it's really the do-it-yourself learning approach. And maybe then at that point, having an internal audit look at the gaps based on your internal understanding, maybe having your certification body when they come for one of your surveillance audits, give you a report here where your gaps are. And there's some risks with going with that. There's our understanding of it is what our certification body told us we risk, uh, you know, where, where our gaps are. I mean, they, they can't consult with you. They can't tell you here's how to fix it. They can't even in the, in the amount of time that they have with you, they can only extend your knowledge so far. Well, the level two types of organizations are those who are more in this for a, let's get this thing in place and grab some of the low-hanging fruit. We're going to be living with a standard for a long time. We don't have to do everything at once. We're not going to invest in any major improvements right now. Maybe we'll do some of that later. Of course, they're doing all the learning activities, maybe getting their, you know, their reading, going to, going to webinars and articles and getting the gap assessment done. And maybe these are the folks who say, well, let's send some people to an internal auditor class and have them do ISO 9001-2015 based audits on us as we go through the transition. Let's have them, uh, let, let's, let's have uh, maybe send a few people out and get some outside training. And once again, that's a, that's a fantastic step to learn more about how the standard works and to begin applying it early on. But just be sure you're getting enough knowledge to really squeeze the juice out of this thing. 
Um, the, the stronger the people are you send to the internal auditor training and the more quickly you begin having them apply that knowledge and teach other people about what they're learning, the more likely you'll get those level two gains of grabbing that low hanging fruit without making major investments. Now the level three organizations are the ones who are saying, this is our chance to really take a good hard look. This is like moving into a new house. Okay, we're going to throw away some of the stuff we've been hauling around forever and we don't need. Let's get that dumpster out front, but we're not going to throw away the baby with the bathwater to mix my metaphors a time or 10 as I am wont to do. So the level three organization says it's not enough just to get the internal auditors trained, just to have the quality geeks understanding this through their reading and their and their articles and their their informational sessions. Let's have an implementation workshop. Let's begin to get some outside expertise on what it takes to implement ISO 9001. Maybe take a day and a half, have some follow-up webinars topic specific on things like how to design requirements maybe need to change. How can we beef up our, our planning overall? How can we apply this to working with our outsource folks? So having some follow-up implementation workshops, those are the kinds of things that very strong level three organizations are already pursuing, as we've seen from our clients. They're analyzing and teaching the application of ISO 9001-2015 concepts throughout the organization, process by process, functional group by functional group. Now in the, um, in the promotion for this class, we said, what is the number one most important decision for you to make before you update any documents? Because I'm afraid some organizations are just gonna go in and start saying, well, let me remap all these requirements to the new numbers and start changing documents around. I'll bet you a lot of the people who are already on this call have an idea of what's gonna come next. It's in 4.1, understanding the organization and its context. Let's read that. Let's read that together. The organization shall determine external and internal issues that are relevant to its purpose and its strategic direction and that affect its ability to achieve intended results of its quality management system. Now, when you understand how your organization fits into the marketplace, how it fits into the broader context of your, your overall corporation, because in many cases you're a corporate smaller entity, maybe a plant, maybe maybe a business unit that's got a certificate. Uh, maybe you are a uh, subcontract manufacturer who is providing services to someone else. What is your context? Only when you understand how it fits in your organization can you begin to, uh, to apply this stuff accurately. So that's where your internal study of the standard begins is the context of your organization. Okay, so that was step one. You need to understand the context. And as I said, it's not a start and finish. Okay, we got that now, let's move on. You're gonna deepen your understanding as you go through this entire transition process and over the coming years. You just, you just learn more and more as you go. But step number two in the model that Sarah works with our clients is to develop a clause matrix, a change matrix for how ISO 9001-2015 will be applied in your organization. Okay, these kinds of templates of what did ISO 9001, 2008 and 2015 say, I've just shown an excerpt of one here, the mapping clause by clause. You want to align the current versus the new requirements in a matrix within your organization. It's a, it's a working document. You'll start filling in with the, the details with something that's handed to you. This analysis has already been done. You notice I've got TL 9000 on, on my copy of it because we're already working with our clients on upgrading to the 2016 version of TL9000. In the next column H, rather than just doing a level one remapping of, oh, I'm gonna renumber my documents, I'm gonna add some words. No, column eight says describing the required changes in your business's own terms. So what does this mean? What would you really have to do? Not have to do necessarily, but want to do. Where would, where would these things apply within your context? And then columns I and J say, let's start looking at, let's start lining out. What are those processes? Start putting some names of process owners there. Start to start, maybe it, it, it goes across different facilities or different, uh, different departments of your business. Uh, you certainly want to list the processes and maybe some additional information. Now, doesn't this look neat and tidy in a, in a little grid that's got one inch wide columns? Yeah, this is, this is wallpaper, folks. This is going to go 
uh, big wide columns with a lot of information. These are your working papers, but I've just shown it in matrix form. Uh, that you may even put links to other documents that you put in here that show what are your affected processes and documents in describing the changes. So that's kind of a level two approach saying, well, what are the processes that are going to change? What are the big documents? Where do we want to work with this? And then here's where the level three changes happen. You clarify the business value of the changes based on the context of your organization, based on your interested parties. What do they want you to get out of your, uh, of your quality management system? And then you look at um, really outlining the actions to implement. These are some later parts of this matrix that you'll add in. You've started with the first two or three or four columns. And as you go on and get your, your stakeholders involved, you will begin to outline the actions to implementation. Because when you begin to outline those actions to implementation, and there are all the steps in order again on this chart, when you begin to outline the actions to implementation, that's part, you're already beginning to do what the matrix is causing you to do kind of naturally, applying risk-based thinking. What ISO 9001 is telling you to do, it's telling you as you begin your implementation, you're doing what it says here. The organization needs to plan and implement actions to address risks and opportunities. These are about increasing the effectiveness of the quality management system, achieving improved results, preventing negative effects, reducing waste, improving productivity. When you start throwing terms like that around, when you start demonstrating that and how you're guiding your organization to implement ISO 9001, then you start getting the attention of functional managers, of top level managers who say, huh, maybe now is a good time to start working through what we're doing with this, uh, with this opportunity in front of us. Maybe we don't just want to change the names on some documents. Now you notice in here I've put clause ISO 9001-2015.1. That's before any of the shalls start. 0 0.3.3, .3, before any of the shalls in the document start. Do not neglect the introductory comments of ISO 9001 introductory clauses, excuse me, when you go through your learning about it back in step one. Be sure you really read through that and study that as a group. You know how I said that I'm working with the Quest Forum folks on building the TL9000 model? Well, it's really in going through line by line and studying it as a group that we've developed the deeper understanding that allows us to say, where's the juice that we're going to squeeze out of this standard? Okay, now let's talk again about the level one, level two, level three organizations. Level ones are getting that simple from to clause map with the interpretation. That's kind of their level of the matrix. What are we going to change? Quick interpretation of it. The level two organizations who want to begin making some improvements, they'll identify the processes and the documents affected. They will take a deeper dive into where we're going to put the most of our efforts. But the level three organizations will start looking at, in addition, the opportunities and the risks. What are the business benefits that we'll get out of implementing ISO 9001? Where are we really going to put our efforts to get the benefits? Focusing on the context. Okay, so that's step one and step two. You understand the content. You build your clause matrix with all the changes to start to understand what's going to change and, and when and how is it going to change. And then you begin creating the high level plan where you start engaging your process owners and key strategic people. But you've got to understand some things up front, even to be able to talk to some of the top managers. They're relying on you to read and understand this stuff and come to them and say, what do we need? So when you build your high level plan in step three, you want to remember to focus on context. I think I'm going to say that on nearly every slide in this presentation. Go back to your step two matrix where it said what processes are affected. And look at who are those who are those process owners? Who are the people most affected by those processes? Who are the ones who can afford to make the changes, who can spend the money and the time and put the resources in there? Those are your team members. Group together the main actions. And by that, I mean you cannot have the same person who's a process owner of multiple processes, key individual in those. You can't have them do everything at once. So group and prioritize the main actions that you want to get done. You want to get your new document structure in place, for example, before you send people off to start making a lot of changes. You can do some education up front 
group that education up front as one of the main action uh, in the main actions. And then begin to get your key milestones and the estimated times associated with those working with your executive champion, finding out where does this fit into the context of the organization, their goals, their strategies, what are the leaders trying to get done with key customers who may have timelines that they want you to achieve on this. For example, subcontract manufacturers may be asked to step up a lot faster than some other folks might, might think. Begin to plan your team kickoff, which is step four, Begin to engage your process owners and functional managers and talk about the workshops that they'll need. And outline your high-level plan. Look at what your internal audit plan is going to look like down the line. When do you want to start doing that? So these are the types of things that we do with our clients in step three of creating their high-level plan. If you haven't introduced it to anybody, you're still socializing the plan at the, this point. The level one folks are looking at what documents am I going to change I got to get my quality manager, my quality professionals to start to start making these changes and telling the organizations what had to change, educating them so they can answer audit requirements because we're going to have an audit coming through here to close those gap assessment findings right off the bat. You know what? There are some organizations for whom a level one approach may be all they can bite off right now with all they've got going on. I don't mean to criticize anyone for taking a a level one approach if that's right for the context of your organization. But I think a lot of companies may sell themselves short by trying to go for a quick fix of just closing gap assessment findings. So where are the level two folks? The level two folks are, are looking more at a process focus. They're looking at the risks and opportunities as they create that high level plan. They're engaging those stronger process owners who stand to gain the most. And you'll see pockets of strong adoption in the level two organizations because they're going for the low hanging fruit, the most bang for the buck. But the level three organizations who are saying, let's really take a business focus to this, uh, uh, to, to this endeavor. Those people are going to look at understanding the new concepts and the new quality management principles. They're digging deep into how do we educate and use this to, to take our organization to the next level. These are the people who've kind of been chafing at the bit. They've kind of maybe been coasting for a while and saying when this new standard comes out, now's the time we're really going to dig in and make 2016 or 2017, whenever the, the year may be, the year that we, that we really build up our quality management system capabilities by focusing on integrating quality with our strategy. The uh, interested parties from the corporate entities to the customers to the outsource suppliers and all employees across across the board are getting involved and in using this as a time, a transition period to really grow. OK, so that's step one, step two, step three. You've got your high level plan. You've begun to socialize this. So the folks, the process owners who are going to be involved, they already have a good idea. Hey, something's coming and they're waiting for the kickoff. Yeah, yeah, you've been telling me all about it. Let me know when you're ready for me to get started. That's the kickoff phase. And I said this in the, in the promotional material for this. Who's going to be there and what's going to happen at the kickoff? Well, in the kickoff, you're going to have the people who are most actively involved in ensuring the transition success. For a level one organization, your kickoff may be fairly limited. But if you're a level three organization, it may be a pretty involved affair. Certainly the champion needs to stand up and, and say some words about what's happening here, why it's happening. The process owners who've already been made aware of what's going on, they need to be there because they're responsible for the changes and they want to look eyeball to eyeball to their peers around the room and say, all right, we're all in this together. And then the core team, those are the quality professionals who have been learning all about what do these changes mean? What's our strategy for making the changes? How are we going to support the process owners? Those are the people who really understand the standard they're there as the resources, the gung-ho, let's get this done. We're here to help you folks. We recommend at Desera when we work with our clients, depending on the size of the organization, but it's kind of a one-two punch, makes a lot of sense for a lot of organizations. You have a main session. That's a stand-up. The executive champion is saying, here's what we're doing. We need you all on board. Let's work on this all together. Now, this is where management says, we mean this. It's on your goals. There are bonus dollars in some cases associated with this. We expect you to be spending time on this along with your organizations. You do that basic level of teaching what is, of what does ISO 9001 say, because so far people have only looked at it 
the process owners have probably only looked at it from how does this affect their particular organization. They're digging into the clauses if they're design and development, they're looking at those clauses. If they're manufacturing, they're looking at it through that lens. Top management may have had a little bit of exposure to it through some executive briefings, but you're teaching them the context and remembering what? Oh yeah, remembering the context of the organization. Remembering who are the interested parties and what do they want for us to achieve here. In this main session, you review the change matrix. You begin refining where people say, no, I don't think that really applies to us, or oh, we've already got that pretty well underway. Most of all in this session, you're listening to the concerns, the risk, the opportunities. You wanna see, are people on board with this? Do you need some more management commitment? Is this really the right time, the right people, the right, the right actions to be taking taking now, and you, and you let them air out those thoughts about how do we really want this to benefit our organization. Then go away and sleep on it. Have a follow-up session. Have a follow-up session where you refine, you've got some more timing on when are we starting some of our implementation workshops, who's first, who's second, what's the order of this. Reinforce the high-level plan after you've done some refinement to it, and make sure you've got eyeball to eyeball commitment. Now who's really in these things? This can be anywhere from this can be anywhere from half a dozen people to 50 people. I did I did one with people from all over the world in one big conference room with 50 people. This was not a nice 9001 2015 implementation, but a, but a but a 2008 implementation where we had process owners who prioritized coming in. The business said we're going to get all in here together and do this. But let's go through the level one, level two, level three approach again. The level one where really it's being driven by the quality function. You just may come out at a staff meeting and say, um, here's what we're working on. Uh, this we, We've begun work on this. Uh, not a lot that anybody else has to do right now. Here's where we're going. It's kind of an announcement. You're not scaring anybody with how much they have to do because if you're either largely already applying a lot of these concepts or you're just going to do the bare minimum right now to get ready for transition and, um, and, and, you, and you're not looking to bite off a bunch of improvements. Level one really may be a lot, not much more than an announcement. But a level two kickoff focuses on how hard are we going to work at this? It's more educational. It's not so much let's get into the, uh, let's not get into the, um, into the nuts and bolts of who's going to do what and when. We're just, we're just exposing you to this. And we're going to give you some commitments and priorities a little further down the line because actually it's a smaller group that's going to be making these uh, making these changes. So you haven't re you're not really getting out and driving a whole lot of enthusiasm and get on board yet. You're just saying uh, uh, we're, we're starting to make the changes. But the level three, this is where you you uh, you deliver that management commitment. Management really expects us to do this. Uh, it's it's on our goals. Like I said, the kinds of things they're saying and the level three kickoff becomes a workshop. You're really digging into the change matrix. You're digging into the high level plan and you're making it very clear to everyone what the next steps are, what's the purpose of this, and here's how we're moving forward as an organization. All right, let's summarize where we've gone so far. On this slide on the screen right now, we talk about we've gone over the content, your quality quality professionals have dug into what's in the content, what does this mean to us. You created the matrix that says here are the clauses, how they map, which, which processes they apply to. You've created a high level plan. We know about how long this is going to take us, who are the people who are going to be involved, what are the benefits we expect to get, and why are we really doing this, in what order, and, and how's our approach. You've held a kickoff. You've begun to get the people involved. Uh, we're starting now. It's on. It's on the radar. People have uh, objectives tied to this in their in their day to day life. You've got some meetings lined up. So, what are the actions that people are going to be implementing? Well, you need to expect your executive champion to be continuing the level of learning through their peers, through their A team, through their through the other directors and vice presidents. What's happening and why? It's not going to be a huge agenda item. But the language that that executive champion is using, the, uh, the, the feedback that they're giving in their staff reports about here's what's going along with this, it goes a long way to socializing what's happening down the line. They're also beginning to apply this so that those leaders 
have the language to talk to when they're asked in an audit or when they're asked by customers uh, what's going on with, with ISO 9001 2015. So that executive champion has a key role of driving learning, but also making sure down the line that those cross-functional activities are happening. The way the Tessero group works with our clients is that we've got the process owners working with a core team of quality professionals as coaches and facilitators to deepen their understanding. This is where you go in, and we've, we've got a series of workshops. We'll be delivering them as webinars going forward. Uh, you'll, you'll see these, and, and maybe some of them are actually showing up on our website already um, as, at the time, if you're watching this as a replay, of what to do, uh, when to do things, how to do things. We're, we're having uh, key concept uh, webinars, and then we can come in and we can teach those workshops within your organization to deepen the understanding. Let's go through a workshop on context, on interested parties, on risk-based thinking. How are we applying risk-based thinking in our various processes? We can teach that as a cross-functional workshop, or you as quality professionals may lead that. What is our intent and how are we doing that in our organization? Uh, you teach something like a risk-based thinking workshop to the process owners and the uh, with a core team leading it so that it then drives a consistent understanding within your context of how are we uh, how are we using this as we adapt our processes and answer the requirements of ISO 9001-2015. So you start out with some workshops that drive the concepts and then you go into making the process changes. You look back at your change matrix from step two, you've been expanding it with further information, attaching documents to it, attaching names, attaching benefits, attaching timelines. That matrix is a real working document that's driving your, uh, driving your process. Project owner owns it and is keeping it updated and communicating with the different parts of the organization. So the process owners are making those process changes and educating their organizations in real time, teaching, socializing the model, using the language more of how do we look at risks. Uh, not so much about preventive action anymore, not so much about documents and procedures. It's about how do we retain documented information that says we followed through on what we said we'd do. Remember, you're focusing on risks and opportunities at this, and you're managing your changes as a, um, as a, uh, as a project, with the, typically with the quality department driving it forward. So this is where at the DeSera group we would be we would be kind of doing some coaching from the sidelines and coming in to do some specialized workshops uh, as needed with your organization, but it's kind of in the hands of your quality professionals and your process owners at that point. The level one folks may be spending a lot of time focusing on documents, numbering words. Wait till you see level three, they may not even be renumbering any documents. No place in ISO 9001 does it say that you need to renumber your documents to align with what the new standard says. But the level one folks probably want to get the basics down. They're not doing a whole lot of cross-functional collaboration. They're getting, they're getting the documents in a row because they're focused on preparing for a transition audit, so they're up to speed, and maybe they're going to focus on further improvements later on down the line. A level two organization. Somebody who's doing a level two approach to um, ISO 9001 2015 would be looking at uh, the visible higher impact opportunities as they go through their application. They're doing, uh, you may see variable interest because the low hanging fruit isn't quite so low in some parts of the organization. Okay, so you're gonna see variable interest and the intent is to focus on the essentials. Focus on the things that are really gonna drive you forward the fastest, um, and it's not going to be a whole organization-wide uh, uh, emphasis on benefits and, um, and overhauling the system. But a level three organization, as I said, may not even be focusing so much on what the documents say. They will create documents as needed, but they're looking at how does our system really work. They may take something that looks very different from what they did when they implemented ISO 9001 back in 2000 with an eight-clause model may take a very different look at what their quality management system looks for. This could be in a level three organization based on those workshops where people talk about what do we want to change and how, a real systematic long-term focus on the changes that drives improved cross-functional effectiveness. They're looking at the measures as they go along. How are we, how are we getting better? And uh, 
Uh, furthermore, they're showing as they go through the transition process, the clear buy-in. This really is worth it to our organization. Okay, to summarize the steps, so you're at this point, you're, you're, as, as you move through, you've got the actions, you've got, uh, I'd say about 80% of your work done, 70% of your work done, and then you start the audits, the internal audits that are verifying and locking in key learnings. How far have we come? How far do we still have to go? Nobody wants to wait until they've got all the actions tied up with a neat little bow and said, all right, let's do our audits now and then have to go back and say, man, we really have some opportunities we didn't pay attention to. Step six about audits, unfortunately, is where some organizations start. They train those internal auditors. They say, let's start auditing ourselves into submission here. <laughs> well, that's, that's really kind of putting the cart before the, before the course. I, I hope Andy Nichols is on the line. I'm not, I'm not gonna go back and look at the attendee list right now, but this is a big shout out to Andy Nichols a lot of you may know him from his work on, on LinkedIn and through uh, the old Ellsmar Cove. Through uh, He's a prolific writer. This is his second book, A Guide to Effective Internal Management System Audits, Implementing Internal Audits as a Risk Management Tool. Now, this book came out under the IC9001-2008 version of the standard, but it really was a precursor to what is the new version of the standard say. It says, use your quality management system Use your internal management system audits to drive your organization forward. So yes, of course you start using the principles of ISO 9001 2015 in your internal audits from the start. That's great. But um, really at this point, you, you need to get the, the, the dig in deep to applying risk-based thinking to assessing and refining your management system. Okay. so. Remember what we talked about in, in the early clauses of ISO 9001, it talked about risk-based thinking. Let's apply that to assessing and refining the system, to your internal audit program, as well as to your third-party audits. One of the risks, when you look at your internal audit program, and I think we've probably got a lot of people on, on watching this webinar who are heavily involved in internal audits, you've got a real risk if you train on ISO 9001 2015 check that box, we're done, we're moving forward, we're using it. Have you really retained the learnings? So training too early in, the, in your transition process and calling it done and not revisiting it, real risk of your internal audit program. The second point is insufficient training on the standard and insufficient training on audit skills. If people are going through and saying, well, I sent one or two people to external training and they're gonna train everyone else, uh, you probably have some super strong auditors in your organization, but you have to, but, but not all organizations have that. You really have to look and say, do we have the skill internally to train our auditors, to really apply those skills and to recognize if we're applying them effectively? I've seen organizations where they send people out who are just way too busy to devote the time and attention to audits, or they're not suited to it based on, on what they like to do in their jobs. Or, or what they're asked of elsewhere in their jobs to be doing. Um, I went in to do a, a, an audit of a software development process. I was gonna train, so, uh, you work with their audit team to do their software development audit. They had their audit team consisted of their quality manager, one of their uh, accountants, one of their facilities managers, and an administrative assistant. That was their audit team at the time the Sara Group arrived to work with that organization. So they kind of chose some very, very diligent, detail-oriented people, but they weren't the people who were equipped to audit a software development process. So be sure that you choose the right people to work on your internal audits, that you equip them with the right skills and the knowledge of processes and how good is good enough, and then give them the time it takes to audit well. These are some risks that you should be looking at in how you conduct your internal audit program as you move toward your um, toward your uh, uh, transition assessment. Make sure that you're planning your audits uh, and reviewing them as a cohesive whole. A lot of audits are done over a period of time and they're not really reviewed as a cohesive whole. They are just documenting non-conformities. So look at what they're telling you about the system. But with ISO 9001-2015, with the extra training you're gonna be doing with your auditors, the next part of this slide talks about 
uh, what are the uh, what are some opportunities in the internal audit program? Well, here's your chance to look at your audit program and say, let's take a risk-based approach, as highlighted in the book that I just mentioned to you. Let's uh, let's audit by processes, not by clauses. Yeah, that's old hat to a lot of you on this call because you're the proactive thinkers, but that's not universally applied. A lot of folks are going out and saying, well, I've checked the box, I've looked at all these clauses. No, you need to be looking at the processes. This is a real opportunity to retrain and refocus your, your internal auditors. This is a chance to do some collaborative learning, to use outside technical experts. You may have some budget associated with quality management system during your transition phase that you won't have later on. This is an opportunity within your internal audit program to truly upgrade skills. It's not just about knowing the clauses. Okay, in step six, applying risk-based thinking to uh, the assess and refine the system part of your um, of your of your quality management system uh, six steps. This is a good time to ask about outside support. As I mentioned, we go out and we support internal audit programs both through training them as well as through coaching them and on up to conducting their internal audits for them. What we're finding is a number of number of our clients, number of our new clients are looking at how might we use external expertise to bring us along rather than just sending people the training, okay? Sending people the training and then asking them to immediately apply what they've done may not lock it in. Let's, uh, let's use some of these external experts that we bring in to do our internal audit training. Use their objectivity. Use their technical knowledge, like I was saying in software development or manufacturing processes or how do you audit top management in different ways than may have been asked before. Let's, uh, let's use those outsiders to model effective audit skills for the internal team and let them learn as they go. One of the things that outside auditors can do, I was talking to a guy who said, oh yeah, I love it when you guys come in here because then my CB auditor, he knows you guys. He knows what you're up to. He's a little bit more on his toes when he comes in to audit when he knows you're gonna be looking at what he's found or hasn't found. So sometimes using outside support for your internal audits can actually be a benefit in looking at your um, at your third party system as well. So we offer internal audit training, internal uh, audit outsourcing services, and we would like to talk with you about some of that. It's on our website. So let's look at the internal audit step six. What level one organizations, they're focusing on gap closure. They're using their existing skills applied to the new requirements. And you've often got implementers auditing each other because it's done largely by the quality audit team. Those are the people you've got. They're auditing each other. You're probably gonna, you're probably gonna get through to something that'll actually pass an audit, but you might not be getting the, uh, the benefits out of this that the level twos have been maybe digging in deeper along the way are getting. Level two organizations are uh, getting timely and effective training and coaching, so they're applying it real time right when they get it. They maybe get some outside support to support that risk-based thinking. They're really up upgrading their audit program. And the level three folks may be getting technical experts and outsourced internal audits, and they're really doing a deep dive in the internal audits. They're really looking at the effectiveness. That's the intent behind the standard anyway. They're looking at the competence of folks working in the processes. They're looking at the risks in the processes. These are the folks who are saying, we really want to get the big benefits out of ISO 9001. They're digging in deep in this phase. It's not about passing a third party audit and getting a certificate. It's about saying, how much farther can we really go to improve our quality management system? Okay, so these are the six steps in summary. Learn the content, which goes on throughout the process and over the next years of your career. You're constantly learning and getting a deeper, deeper understanding of the content, but your true quality professionals are driving that from the start and socializing it through the organization. You develop a clause matrix in step two, where you compare the old to the new, you look at where it applies to the different processes, you look at how you stand to benefit and who should be working on those changes. Step three, you create a high level plan based on that matrix in your understanding. You find out who needs to be working on this. What's your timing? What does management expect? How far do they wanna go? Are they a level one, a level two, or a level three when it comes to approaching ISO 9001 2015 certification? Once you've got that high level plan established, you're ready to begin step four. Have the kickoff, 
get the key process owners, the, the, the executive champion, the quality professionals all in the room together, eyeball to eyeball and say, here's what we're going to do, when we're going to do it, here's the deadline, here's what we really seek to accomplish. And then level five, work through deepening that understanding, applying ISO 9001 2015 to, the, um, to your key processes. Um, begin to look at the risks, look at the opportunities, look at the expectations of your internal and external interested parties. Find yourself in the context of your corner of the, uh, of the industry and say, what are we really trying to accomplish around here? And then when you get towards the conclusion of implementing those actions, but not waiting until the very end just before you do your third party assessment, begin doing the audits and saying, how close are we to completion? What more do we want to do? Where are our risks and our benefits that we want to highlight to our stakeholders? And what do we still want to accomplish in the future? Make sure you have the right people on board for doing those audits and consider getting some outside support. So that's a summary of the six steps to ISO 9001 transition that we use with our clients. We've got about five minutes left in the hour. I'm sure some, uh, some questions have been coming in. I see some coming in here, but I haven't gone over to look at them. So I'm going to ask uh, I'm going to ask Joe to facilitate the question and answer session. Joe, thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Can you go to the next slide for us? Yeah, there we go. So again, if you want to ask some questions, please use the question box on the right hand side of your screen, and we will take them in order. I'm going to give Karen a little bit of time to review some of the questions that have come in, but before we get back to those, let's talk a little bit about what's next. So Karen, if you can bump up to the next slide for me. Sure. There are several things that need to happen, and Karen's talked about several of them already. The first is understanding ISO 9001-2015. A lot of different ways to go about that. Certainly, we can help you with that in your transition training. We can do instructor-led, either remote or in person. Uh, we can do a detailed review of the new standard 9001-215. The key concepts is also some of the things that we're going to be doing webinars on in the future. And as Karen mentioned earlier, if they're not on our website now, uh, they will be soon. Uh, the transition workshops will build on what Karen talked about, her six-step process today, what to do, when, who, how, all those great things that we covered in that six-step process. The gap assessment, one of the big questions you have to think through is who should do it. Are you going to do it yourself? Are you going to have the certification body do it? Are you going to have DSAR do it? Are you going to have a combination? There are some benefits and pluses and minuses to all of it. Uh, certification bodies cannot consult, so if they were to come in and do your gap assessment, they can only tell you where you meet and don't meet the requirements of the standard. They can't tell you how to fix anything. They're not allowed to consult. We are certainly allowed to do that, so we can give you several op options as to how to approach and how to actually meet the requirements of the standard. And then finally, the internal audit training. Uh, we come in and we can do some internal audits for you. We can help train your organization internal auditors uh, to do the, the new, new style of auditing uh, that Karen uh, talked a little bit about. So with those in mind, you can go to our website. The websites are listed up there, www.dsaragroup.com. Any of the live training on location, gap assessment, or internal audit upgrade services, you'll be able to find your way around fairly easy on that. So with that, Karen, are you ready for some questions? I am. I, I, okay. see, uh, I see one of them here. In your estimation, what is the ballpark time frame for, um, for transition for different organization levels, level one, two, and three? And, uh, you know, there, there's the, um, the question is, the, my favorite answer to that is, it depends. You know, what is, what is ballpark? So, for example, one of our clients is a, uh, a, a small company. They're all housed in one facility. Uh, we have through our consulting with them over the years, we've, we've built a lot of this kind of thing into the stuff that they're already doing. Okay, they're already using us for their outsourced internal audits, so we've begun to move them toward this as we've seen the standard coming along. They'll, they, they may very well be ready for their, uh, uh, for their transition assessment. Uh, they'll probably do some renumbering of documents, not necessarily. They'll make some changes. They'll do some training. I'll bet you within six months, a company like that will be easily ready to go through a transition audit. For the level three organization, I'm thinking of, of one that is going through a, a merger. They've got, uh, they've been saying, all right, let's, let's consolidate this all at once. And uh, when we get our new certificate that covers the overall, um, the overall new organization, they're going to be working on this on up to, on up to 2018 probably. I believe they're, they'll probably carry their 2008 transition for, uh, they'll carry on the transition over a full three year period. 
I don't think that's a bad idea. I don't think it's a bad idea for a level three organization to say we're working on our transition over a two to three year period. I think the um, uh, the benefits of that are that you kind of hold out that carrot in front of people for a while. But a level three transition needn't be a full three years. Some of our TL9000 clients are already working on understanding all of this. So when do you say when do you say the line starts? But I would say when you kind of look when do you say the process starts? Does it start with your initial understanding? Does it start with your kickoff? So um, ballpark time frame, I'd say a level one you can do in a matter of months. Level three is going to be in a in a matter of years. But it all depends on where your organization is starting from. Another question I, I see here is, um, let me see. Do you think it's critical that we retrain lead auditors to the 2015 standard, or do we need to focus on learning the new standard? Once an auditor, always an auditor. You know what? Before you can really plan on uh, plan on being an well, it depends on what does it mean. Retrain lead auditors to the 2015 standard. I know companies who are working with Quest Forum on revising the ISO 9001 standard. Those folks are long experienced auditors who have dug into where do you place the commas in uh, additional clauses that support ISO 9001 2015 through the TL 9000 additional requirements. And those people probably are not going to go through a lead auditor course. They are experts in their field. I don't think every lead auditor needs to go through retraining. I think you can demonstrate competence without needing to go through a class. But I do think that those people who are not going through training and who are the leaders will gain a lot through, is it, is it formal training? They need to go through relearning. They need to go through looking at this on a deeper dive. Um, and I think everybody in the organization who's associated with auditing does need to spend some time with, with learning what it actually says and becoming familiar with it so you can meet your third party auditor eyeball to eyeball. I don't think it's a good idea to say I've been trained once and I've continued to do it and I don't need further um, for, further knowledge. That would be you know resting on your laurels. So people will be working to, to learn more. Joe, can you, uh, can you see, see any other questions? Because I've had some that have come yes. in to me that I said I was going to address in this, uh, in this session, even though they weren't here to ask. Yes, I've got a couple of other ones that, uh, that did come in. One of them deals with um, the ISO 9000 standard. You mentioned ISO 9000 up front and throughout the presentation. What is the gain from looking at ISO 9000? Yeah, ISO 9000 is very important. It's got the, it's the vocabulary and fundamentals of, um, of, uh, that are used throughout ISO 9001. It's got, um, that's where you've got the seven quality management principles based on some work by Deming. We're going to have a whole, uh, we're going to have a whole webinar around that coming up and it will be fundamental within our, uh, within our training programs it is fundamental. It's something that we already use and base a lot of our work on. Uh, so it's got key concepts in it that will support you in training and socializing the concepts of that you'll use in implementing ISO 9001. Okay, there's another question that came in. It said, what's the cost to upgrade? I'm in a 100-person company, no interest in Q except the management rep. So I would assume that means not a lot of management commitment at this point. Yeah, a, a, a level one kind of company. That's yeah. the kind of person who's going to go out and do the, uh, maybe get some outside training. Um, I, I see training programs are running on average for public training courses. They're running roughly uh, $500 per learner per day. Um, that person may want to, when you, when you look at a company like that, I, be, I believe the person who asked this question is a, is a consultant, if I recognize that name, but a, um, a, uh, a person who's going out to outside training and then bringing it internally and teaching the rest of the company is going to have very minimal costs. Right. I mean, you 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 may do the gap assessment yourself. You may call in an outside consultant to do some work to the tune of uh, a thousand, couple thousand a day to do the to do some internal assessment work and some coaching along the way. And then the rest of the costs are borne by those people who are doing the upgrades and uh, you know it's within the course of their work. But I've seen companies for whom a focus of uh, overhauling a quality management system gets into the tens of thousands of dollars. So again, it depends, but the training itself, you can expect roughly $500 per learner per day. If you bring it in-house, you save the cost of training, uh, of travel for those people. 
you can educate more people for the same number of dollars. We pretty much estimate that if you've got five or more learners, it pays to bring an instructor onto your facility to do the training there. And uh, you get more out of it because you're really getting your questions asked in your environment. And by using a consultant instead of a CB to do that training, you can really ask questions specific to your organization. Great, Karen. I think we've got time for one more has come in. Could you please clarify slash provide example of a level three organization? Does it mean organization that has multiple sites globally? Thank you. No, a level three organization can be an end it, that 100 person organization could be a level three organization. In fact, I think that that little tiny client that I was telling you about of ours, uh, if they had, if they were starting out with, uh, maybe they had just been having a kind of a one man band like the question just a minute ago asked about, that one man band could become a level three organization. That, that manager could have just seen the light and said, we're going to take this up to a world-class level, attention to detail in analyzing our risks, in focusing on our customers, in working with our external providers to, to develop a, a superior level of quality than we've ever done before. Level three is not relative to every other organization out there in the world. It's relative to what they've been doing within their organization up until now. So when I look at a level three organization, it's saying somebody who really want, who's taking a very um, deep approach to advancing their skills and their application of quality management principles. Now, when I, when I think of sites that uh, I, I know some, I mean, they're, they're the names that you would think of. One that, that I know won't be afraid to have me mention this is Cisco as far as a level three organization. They're very deeply involved in TL9000. They use it all over the world. They've got very strong and robust training and a very strong and robust application of quality management principles. That would be an example of a level three organization that is taking this that seriously as they go forward, but it could also be a very tiny organization. Good deal. Well, we've just about run out of time, so thank you all for attending, and Karen, oh, thank you for... Thing. I do have one more one slide more. that I want to share, and this is a preview oh. of where we're going with uh, with some of the some of the resources that are, that'll be available. These will be on our website. Uh, depending on when you watch this, whether you're live today as it's being recorded or down the line, you'll see our ISO 9001 Key Concepts Series. Joe, did you know you were going to be doing all these? I did. <laughs> I know. You've already got these underway, and we've, we're, we're scheduling these for uh, the coming weeks. You'll see these in uh, uh, these are the words that you've been reading as you've been as you've been reading the standard as you've been uh, attending uh, webinars and and getting educated about it. We'll have 30 to 60 minute webinars that you can take these in the in, in the series and learn about ISO 9001 2015. But we'll also have the binge watch version of this where you can learn it as an e-learning format or you can learn it as a um, you can learn it as an in-house workshops as we as we introduce these in the context of your own processes. So the ISO 9001 key concepts that will be coming out as a webinar series, but also integrated into our various training and uh, workshop programs. And then we already have our internal audit process owner training, executive brief, briefing courses. Uh, you can find those on our website. You can uh, do preparing for transition assessment workshops. Um, We'll offer those in both webinar and on-site work. As 2016 progresses, we'll be doing TL9000 work. We'll have a workshop on conducting virtual audits, and we've got a course in development right now on auditing the software development processes in an agile environment. I think that's something that your certification body auditors will also be very interested in. It's not just for in-house training. Virtual audits may be new to you as well when you've got when you've got large organizations. So these are some of the things that you'll be able to see from the Tessera Group going forward. Watch for our promotions, and I hope that you'll that you'll forward our announcements on to other members of your organization who may be interested in some educational opportunities. Great, thank you, Karen. Thank you, everyone, for attending. We look forward to uh, to, to working with you in the future. Bye now.